Hi, good afternoon. Uh, this is Robert Chisholm um, from Chisholm, Chisholm and Kilpatrick. With me today is Jenna Zellmer and Carrie Baker. And we're going to be talking about a number of things that are included in the 2019 VA budget. Um, is that the right, right way to say it, Carrie? That's, uh, that's pretty close. <laughs> okay, so it's not something Congress wants. This is actually what VA would like the budget to be and how it wants to allocate its resources. And more importantly, um, we're going to be talking about some legislative proposals. That's laws that they want to change, that VA wants to change. Um, so we're going to go through a number of these things. Um, if you have any questions, please type your question in and we'll try and answer it to the best of our ability. Um, and we're going to jump right in. There are two sets of things that we're going to talk about. In general terms, we're going to talk about benefits first, a couple of proposals that can impact uh, veterans' benefits. And then the second thing we're going to talk about is a couple of health uh, benefit proposals as well. Um, but let's start with the VBA proposals, the Veterans Benefits Administration proposals, and, and those are things that could actually impact a veteran's ability to receive compensation. Right, Carrie and Jenna? Yes. That's correct. All right, so I'd like to start off with, um, in general terms, the VA has a proposal, and I'm going to call it what's needed to get an examination. Okay, in, in its simplest terms, we call that the duty to assist. Um, but What's the importance of an examination first before we talk about what, how one goes about getting an exam? Why are they important? Jenna, you want to go? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, so VA puts a lot of stock in their VA examinations. Um, generally, when you're trying to establish service connection, the VA is going to send the case to an examiner to determine whether or not there's a nexus between the veteran's disability um, and his service. So. Um, you know, depending on the VA examiner's opinion, that really makes or breaks the case. Um, and then once the service-connected disability, you know, is service-connected, then it's all a matter about what the examiner says the level of impairment is. So let's talk about it. Let's give an example. Let's suppose um, a veteran files a claim. And presently, they're alleging that I had a back injury in service, I have a back condition today, but there's no evidence in the record yet that says that the back condition that the veteran's currently suffering from was a result of what happened in service. Right. Generally speaking, as long as they complete an application right now, aren't they going to get an exam? They should, yes, sir. yes. Okay, that's generally the way the law works. I mean, there's some wrinkles to that, but yeah. in general terms. And that's probably, the examination is probably the most important part of a claim, because that's usually the, the issue in these cases. Agreed. And I'd say VA's historically struggled, struggled with what it is that triggers their duty to get that examination. You know, in your example, yep. um, I would say I generally would agree that you know, you've got that incident in service, you've got that current disability, they're going to need to get that exam. Sometimes, depending on how one might interpret the current rules, uh, they might look for something that indicates one of those two events are related to the other. Um, and so there's always a question So let's of, talk about that when you yeah. use the word indicate. So if mm -hmm. the veteran says, look, I've had problems since service with my back, and mm -hmm. it's five years later and I'm still having problems, that's going to be enough, isn't it? it yes. that, that should be enough. It's yeah. a very low threshold. Very low threshold. Not much evidence that needs to be in the record. But now with the 2019 budget, VA is proposing a new law to change the law to actually make it more difficult, if I'm reading this correctly, for veteran, veterans and dependents to get examinations. Is that, is that correct? That's absolutely correct. All right. right. So do you want to hit why that, what the change is as you understand it, Jenna? And yes. let me start by saying we don't know why they want to change this thing, so we're going to be giving our opinions on it. <laughs> um, and we don't know exactly how it would be interpreted by the courts. And again, we're just giving our opinions on it. But it's not a good thing in my opinion. Right. So under the Veterans Benefits Administration's proposed change, um, a veteran would need to have objective evidence of a disability or an injury in service. Um, and that's, that's a higher burden than what currently happens now because a lot of times veterans don't have that objective evidence. We don't really know what VA is going to consider objective evidence, but chances are it's going to be a notation in a service treatment record. But there are lots of 
instances in which a veteran doesn't have a service treatment record. For instance, if he was in combat, um, in military sexual trauma cases, a veteran often won't report the sexual trauma at the time that it's occurred. And so there's no objective notation that the veteran actually experienced an in-service event. But that doesn't mean it didn't occur. But under the proposed change, that could really limit a veteran's opportunity to get a VA examination. In general, ultimately, if a veteran isn't able to get that kind of an examination, it's going to be very difficult to win the claim. Yes, yes. The veteran could theoretically, you know, submit his own private examination, but um, historically, from my experience, that the VA really doesn't put a lot of um, stock into those kinds of exams. Carrie, do you ever have any other thoughts on the issue of uh, what what's going to be necessary to get a medical examination if this new proposal becomes law? Well, I think you kind of hit it. Uh, we don't know how it will be interpreted. Um, I think it's important to point out, though, that, that, that the proposals in the VA's budget submission are summaries of the proposal. They don't uh, print their detailed explanation of why they want that proposal in there. So there's information that we don't know. Um, and frankly, we don't know whether Congress will even act on any of these proposals, but we're just bringing yeah. it to our audience's attention so that they can be aware of these things. And I, there's some things that, you know, that, that, are, that are signposts, so to speak, uh, that's in the budget submission. So at one point, they state that the courts have currently interpreted uh, the, the current duty to assist veterans more limited than VA or Congress intended. I think that's an interesting uh, a point there. First, it's the court's job, as the, both each of you can explain, to interpret Congress's intent, yep. not VA's. Yep. Um, and so this all boils down to how much VA has a duty to assist a veteran in obtaining the evidence necessary to make a fully informed decision on a claim. And it, a lot of times, as, as each of you have indicated, it comes down to whether there is an examination with a potential nexus between A and B, an injury in service uh, or uh, in a current disability. And nexus is really just a fancy way of saying some kind of connection. Right. And another example, uh, to, to piggyback on what Jenna said, I think another example is, is combat veterans. Yes. The, there's, there's lots of rules and regulations and court decisions out there that, that, that explain how combat veterans have a lower standard to show an injury that occurred during a combat situation simply because during those situations they're rarely documented because of the, the circumstances of combat. So VA could literally be uh, restricting uh, or raising the bar on a combat veteran to show that his disability occurred during that combat when it's, it, it's not going to be part of his record, they're not going to get an examination. Knowing what we know about how uh, the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims has interpreted combat and injury in service, mm. um, and if they throw this objective standard into the mix, it's going to change things potentially, and not for the better, um, in my no. opinion. So um, if we were saying whether we give uh, two thumbs up, I think it's two thumbs <laughs> down on this proposal, right? Definitely. A absolutely. Okay. So um, we represent a lot of veterans from the Vietnam era. Uh, who served in Vietnam, who served in Thailand. Um, many of those veterans who served in both Thailand and de definitely in Vietnam, boots on the ground, were exposed to Agent Orange. And there's a proposal uh, in the 2019 budget about how VA would like to, um, I'm not going to say redefine, well, I guess it is redefining what an herbicide agent is. That is, what is a uh, herbicide agent for the purpose of the presumption of exposure to Agent Orange. So, Carrie, this is really your area of expertise. You've done a lot of work in this area. So can you sort of walk us through what the law is today? And then once we get that down, let's talk then about what VA is proposing to change. So currently the law on most herbicides is that if you were exposed to what VA defines as a herbicide agent while on active duty and you develop one of a, or more of a list of certain diseases, VA will presume that that disease process is related to that exposure. So you just have to be exposed either presumptively or factually while on active duty to get service connection for the disease. 
So then it comes down to, well, what is a herbicide agent? Uh, VA's regulation currently defines a herbicide agent as a, new, a few different things, 2,4-D, 2,4-5-T, and its contaminant TCDD, cocodylic acid, and picloram. Now, and what you're talking about are chemical agents that they've said, <laughs> if a veteran was exposed to these things, then they're going to get service connection for a number of disabilities. Right, and, and to put that in perspective for Vietnam vets and language that, that they're going to be more familiar with, two four, uh, Agent Orange, for example, was a 50-50 mixture of 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T. Uh, Agent Blue was cocodylic acid, uh, which had a 30-plus percent uh, level of arsenic in it. Uh, Agent White uh, was a mixture of 2,4-D and picloram. So all of, you know, that's where you get all of those individual chemical agents. TCDD, on the other hand, was a, was a combustion byproduct, a contaminant, in the formulation of 2,4,5-T. And remember what I said, 2,4,5-T was 50% of Agent Orange. And so when people talk about the dioxin in Agent Orange, what they're really talking about is the TCDD which, if I can say it, uh, stands for tetrachlorodibenzoparadioxin. Much better than I could say it. <laughs> Trust me, I had to practice. <laughs> uh, so that is a dioxin component of 2,4,5-T. Now, that is the, there are multiple dioxins. Uh, that is the strongest of all dioxins. That is the most potent one on the planet. And that's the, that's the chemical that a lot of other toxic agents are measured against so to speak. And that's not the only dioxin uh, in, in some of these herbicides, but th that's one of them that qualifies as a herbicide agent because it was in a portion of the herbicide that made up of Agent Orange. So, so all these chemicals you're talking about right now, VA currently, if you were boots on the ground in Thailand, you're presumed to have been exposed to all of that. Is that is that a fair characterization? That's okay. correct. That's okay. correct. So the veteran doesn't have to say it was TCDD versus 2,4-T, et cetera. Right. You're, you're presumed exposed. You're presumed exposed to herbicide agents. Yeah. VA will normally say you're presumed exposed to Agent Orange. Orange. Yeah. But in reality, it's it, it, getting down to the letter of the law is you're presumed exposed to a herbicide agent. So what's, what's new... Uh, in the 2019 budget. What's VA trying to do here? Okay, so what we know of their proposal is they want to limit uh, the definition of herbicide agent just to TCDD. Now, th that's problematic in numerous ways, but what's also problematic is, again, some of the signposts that they put in their blurb uh, in, the in the budget submission. One of those signposts are that they believe that the Institute of Medicine, who, who publishes biannual reports on uh, herbicides, have stated that TCDD is the only one that's toxic uh, amongst all of the herbicide agents. That's not true. Uh, and they also state that TCDD was only used in Vietnam. Again, that's not true. Now the, inf the the sort of the evolution of some of this is, as years have gone by, uh, records have come to surface that show some of these agents were used elsewhere, such as on Thailand perimeter, uh, Thailand-based perimeters during the Vietnam War, and so that means more claims for VA. Uh, in my opinion, my opinion only, that this is a way to roll back some of those. Uh, but I said their signposts were somewhat important. So, for example, VA says in its uh, proposal that TCDD is the only toxic one, the only dangerous one. That's not true. Like I said earlier, Agent Blue, which is cocodylic acid, is, is more than 30% organic arsenic, which is the lung carcinogen, uh, as well as uh, uh, carcinogen. It's, it's also carcinogenic in other areas. Agent White, which is picloram, uh, was contaminated with hexachlorobenzene and nitrosamines, both carcin carcinogenic. Hex hexachlorobenzenes have been banned globally. Uh, they were banned in the U.S. in 1966. So for VA to say in a legislative proposal that its own Institute of Medicine studies have found that only TCDD is 
toxic and dangerous is is simply not true. And so you raise a good point. Um, we we at Chisholm, Chisholm, and Kilpatrick, and again, this is Robert Chisholm from Chisholm, Chisholm, and Kilpatrick, Jenna Zelmer, and Carrie Baker, and we're here talking about the 2019 budget. And Lester, we're going to get to your question in one minute, but let me just finish this thought. Um, we have a report on our website, cck-law.com. It's called the Thailand Report, and it goes through in great detail about how Agent Orange was actually used in Thailand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for them to now say, that is for VA to try and limit it, is in my, my opinion, frankly, outrageous. It, it's absolutely outrageous. Uh, they're, they're trying to reel in their own work and at the cost of veterans' benefits. I also think it puts a lot of uh, burden on the veteran to be able to distinguish among all these different herbicides. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, you made a good point um, that a lot of times the shorthand is just Agent Orange. And so, um, you know, veterans don't really know what they were exposed to back then. And, you know, we could barely follow Carrie's, you know, all of his different um, history of all the different Sorry. agents. So, <laughs> no. But, no, I think it, it really illustrates the point that um, making these distinctions between all these really complicated herbicide exposure is way beyond um, anybody's real-life capacity. Well, and, you know, going back to the original, uh, uh, the, or the current, the, when Congress passed the current statute, you know, they knew what they were doing. They, they defined, basically, herbicide agents as, those chemicals used in Vietnam right. without going really any deeper. Um, another point I made earlier was that they indicated that TCDD was only used in Vietnam. Again, that is completely not true. Right. As I stated, TCDD was a contaminant in 245T. Uh, 245T was a herbicide used, uh, especially in the 60s and 70s, all over the place uh, by military and civilians alike. Um, now, Agent Orange itself was, uh, you know, the, the government stopped using it in Vietnam by a direct order in the early 70s. But 245T was still used up until the uh, late 70s uh, by the government. And then in other areas up until the 80s, the EPA did not ban 245T based herbicides completely until 1985. Now that's important because the reason they banned 245T based herbicides was because even by the middle 80s they could not get all of the TCDD or dioxin out of the herbicide. So for VA to insinuate that TCDD was only used in Vietnam, um, I'd be curious to know where they're getting their facts. Uh, well, they, you know, this is an important point because we really don't know what the reason is for this mm -hmm. proposal. As right. you said, it's a summary proposal. Um, I did want to hit Lester's question. Lester's question was, um, I'm on remand, I think, for the third time, if I understood, um, and will that m affect my ability to get an exam? It will not affect your ability to get an exam, and the reason is, first, it's been ordered by the board, and second, the proposal we're talking about is just that. It's a proposal. It's not law yet, and it should not impact your claim in one iota. So that's, that's good news. Um, you should still get your exam. Um, again, if you have any questions about anything we're talking about or anything else on your mind that's veterans benefits related, please feel free to ask us. We'll post the um, report that Robert mentioned before about the history of uh, Asian orange and herbicide exposure in Vietnam and Thailand. We'll post that in the comments. Yeah, we'll give you a direct link to that. That's a really good point. Okay, in order to get to the next topic, um, I think it would be helpful to bring out our little appeals chart. Is that okay? If sure. I can bring out our little appeals chart here and talk about how um, <clears throat> appeals, what are now referred to as legacy appeals work, Jenna. Okay. And so a veteran files a claim for VA benefits right here. They receive a rating decision. Um, if they disagree with that rating decision, I'm gonna move it over <laughs> a little bit. They file a notice of disagreement. Um, if they don't get a favorable decision after that, they get a statement of the case. And if the veteran files a VA Form 9, um, their case will eventually make its way to the Board of Veterans' Appeals. And the Board of Veterans' Appeals has very specific obligations when it comes to what they need to write in their decision, especially if it's a denial. Mm -hmm. And they have an obligation of giving reasons and bases. And in general terms, and so this is at this level right here, um, if their reasons and bases are not 
adequate or not sufficient to inform the veteran of the reason for the decision, the veteran can appeal to the court. And many cases are corrected by the court because of an insufficient explanation. That's sort of my vernacular right. for this. Mm -hmm. But can you tell us a little bit, and I'll put this down, of why this reasons and basis requirement is so essential to the veterans benefits system? Right, Robert. So I think the, the first thing to note is that that whole claim stream from the time that it gets to a claim to the time that it gets to the board can take seven years. Um, and so at, by the time it gets to the board, the veteran has been really invested in, you know, demonstrating why he deserves these benefits. Um, and so it's really important for the board to take that into account and to look at the evidence in the record, which can be thousands of pages long, um, and to make a decision that considers all of the favorable evidence, um, considers the veteran's lay statements, the medical evidence, um, and his service treatment records, and makes a decision that the veteran is allowed, is able to understand. Um, you know, it's really only fair for the veteran who has spent so much time fighting for his claim to have a decision at the end of the day that even if the board denies it, even if we disagree with it, at least he can understand the reasons why the board denied the claim. And so the proposal that VA um, is trying to make is to really cut down the board's reasons and bases requirement. Um, and so basically what this would do is it would result in shorter board decisions that are harder for the veteran to understand. And the other thing is, quite frankly, it would be harder for a veteran to know whether they have a claim that should be appealed to the court as well. Right. And you only have a limited window um, 120 days to right. appeal. Mm -hmm. um, so while this might make the board's job easier in the sense that it doesn't have to give the full explanation that it currently does, mm -hmm. um, it's going to be more challenging for either the veteran's representative or the veteran themselves to determine whether this is the kind of case that should be appealed and could be corrected by the court. Right. Now I have a question uh, for, for either one of you. Do you think this would be used by VA as a shield against judicial review? Well. It could be, I think, is the short answer. We don't know, um, and it depends how it's implemented. Again, these are only summaries of what the, these legislative proposals are simply summaries, um, and we'd be speculating, but my my thought process is that's a distinct possibility. Right. Yeah. And the shorter board decisions, we, won't, we really won't be able to know why the board denied um, a veteran's claim. So they could be relying on a misunderstanding of the law, they could be relying on a misunderstanding of the record, um, but if the board doesn't tell us what they think the record is or what they think the law is, there's no way for us to know if we can appeal it to the court. Um, the next big issue um, that we want to talk about is who's going to be able to represent <coughs> veterans going forward. So presently, a veteran can represent themselves, and that's not going to change. A veteran can uh, hire a veteran service organization to represent them. A veteran could hire an attorney, and a veteran could hire an accredited claims agent. So Carrie, you're an accredited claims agent. Can you tell us what that means? That basically means that I'm accredited by VA uh, to represent veterans at any level before the VA. Uh, I had to pass a test and uh, you know go through all of VA's accreditation process to do that. Uh, so I had to show some bit of proficiency in this process. Uh, and I can, um, uh, from, from the beginning of a claim up through an appeal to the Board of Veterans' Appeals, I can represent a veteran uh, in my own capacity as a claims agent, just like an attorney would, uh, absolutely no different uh, whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so VA wants to get, I'm going to use these words, it's not exactly how they wrote it, but wants to get out of the business of accrediting claims agents. They don't want to be doing that anymore. Is that essentially the proposal? That is, that is the proposal in a nutshell, and that is pretty much all it says. Uh, there's no explanation in it at all uh, as to why they, why they put this proposal forth. So let's take a guess as to why we think it might be. My, my thought process is it's time consuming for them mm -hmm. and they don't want to keep doing it. I mean, it's, I can't think of any other reason why they want to get out of the business of accreditation. And frankly, it's offensive because veterans should have the right to hire a veteran service organization, a claims agent, an attorney. They should not be limited, in my opinion. I feel very strongly about that. Obviously, I do uh, <laughs> since I'm a claims agent. Uh, <laughs> 
and now I've spoke to a few people uh, in VA who are somewhat familiar with this process. Um, they don't know for sure, but they believe, grapevine here, uh, that exactly like you said, Robert, OGC, the Office of General Counsel, is simply doesn't want to put any more uh, power, you know, uh, even their, their personnel to accrediting claims agents. So yeah. again, they want to get out of work. I think that this is going to affect veterans too, because at the moment, you know, attorneys can't charge fees for helping a veteran file a claim, and so veterans are really dependent on VSOs and accredited agents to help them with those initial processes um, to get the claim started. And it's it's a really great lower cost way to get representation, um, and it's really going to affect the veterans. I, I think you're right. It could definitely adversely affect veterans, um, and we're not for it. So before we uh, switch to the veterans' health proposals, um, and some of these are quite frankly positive, and we'll hit those in a second, I just want to sort of summarize the four things we've talked about here, if I could. Um, the first one is VA's proposal to limit veterans' access to examinations. The second one is to restrict a veteran's ability uh, to show that they were exposed to Agent Orange. The third one is we're going to make it easier for the board to deny claims, quite frankly, by simplifying their explanation. And the last one is we're not going to credit claims agents. So if we look at these, these four proposals are really self-serving to the VA. They help the VA and, in my opinion, do not help veterans in any way, shape, or form that I can figure out. In fact, I would add that they hurt veterans. Yeah. So um, we're thumbs down on all four of those. Yeah. All right, let's talk about some good things. Um, there's some veterans health proposals that I think are really important here. Um, and Carrie, let's hit the first one. What is a medical foster home and how might VA, uh, under a new proposal, pay for those for veterans? Okay, let me uh, preface this by saying I'm not a, uh, an expert on the Veterans Health Administration. Um, <laughs> And none of us are. We're really, benefits is our specialty, yeah. but we saw these things and we thought we would share them with you because I think these are positive developments. Mm -hmm. So medical foster homes are similar to, uh, they, they essentially provide the same uh, services as a, uh, as a nursing home, uh, but maybe in a little bit uh, more veteran-friendly manner. Uh, some veterans would prefer. And so this particular uh, change as we understand it would allow VA to actually pay for veterans to be in a medical foster home whereas right now they're not allowed to pay uh, for that care. They are allowed to pay for nursing home uh, but this would expand the group of homes that they could actually compensate for if I understand it correctly. That's correct and as VA explains it and I, I will just assume that they're correct here that it costs them a lot more to house somebody in a nursing home than a medical foster home. Uh, if that's the case, and if veterans as a whole would prefer medical foster homes, then I think that's a good proposal. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that's a, a, a net positive potentially for veterans. All right. The, um, the other thing I want to talk about is uh, amending Military Sexual Trauma Treatment Authority to improve access and to assure uh, continuity of care. Um, can you talk a little bit about this? I can try. Okay, I know. So, uh, you know, VA has special treatment programs for uh, victims of military sexual trauma. Uh, that is currently limited to, uh, quote, psychological trauma, end quote. Uh, this proposal would change that to include also physical disabilities because obviously, uh, depending on the type of trauma, it may not be, you know, the disability uh, that results may not be limited to a psychological trauma. Uh, but right now, the, as the law reads, whatever those special treatments that uh, MST victims can receive are only towards a psychological trauma. So this would open that up to physical uh, problems as well. And I think that's a good thing. Okay. There's two other proposals in here, and I'm not sure exactly how to talk about them, except to give sort of an example here. And um, let's, su let's suppose a, a veteran um, is in an automobile accident after service and gets treatment for, say, a broken leg at a VA hospital. But that veteran also has a third-party insurance, say, through Blue Cross, Aetna Insurance, 
there's a couple of provisions in the bill that would uh, make it easier for VA to get reimbursement for the care it provided through that third party insurer. And I think ultimately that's a good thing because the VA would then not be spending all of its own dollars in that particular instance, mm -hmm. but would be able to recapture or capture some of that uh, benefit um, and then focus on uh, using its uh, mandatory spending on veterans disability related issues. I think that's a good thing because VA normally uh, includes a certain amount of what it anticipates to get reimbursed uh, from third party providers as part of its budget. Uh, but if so, if it doesn't actually receive those funds, then that's a shortfall in its budget. So right. if this was able to help VA keep that, you know, keep that budget where they anticipate it, then uh, uh, you know, they wouldn't have to sort of rob Peter to pay Paul, so to speak, because they don't meet their budget. Okay. Um, tell us a little bit about this telehealth proposal. So the idea between, as I understand about telehealth is that uh, a veteran could use it, you know, a doctor could use telemedicine to help treat veterans, is that correct? Uh, th that is, uh, and again, I'm no expert on telehealth. Uh, right now, as I understand it, there are, there are numerous restrictions on both the uh, VA doctor and the veteran um, on using telehealth. This proposal uh, looks to basically lift those restrictions so that uh, more veterans in more parts of the country and more doctors in more parts of the country can deliver that telehealth. For example, they don't have to be at a VA facility when doing the telehealth. Um, and so if that's the case, if it does open up telehealth to people that aren't currently uh, able to get that, uh, I can see that as a good thing. Um, as I heard one doctor explain it, it allows, um, say, someone in a rural area to go to a VA hospital right. and then consult with an expert in a big city and the, they'll have a conference, mm -hmm. video conference talk and uh, call, and that will really make it right. easier to treat that veteran then and there in that clinic in a remote area. So I think right. that's a good thing. Right. I agree. Yeah, yeah if, you didn't, if you weren't restricted to VA facilities, then obviously uh, you, know, that you, could, you could invoke that kind of telehealth anywhere. Okay. Um, then the other area that we want to talk about are readjustment benefits. And when we're talking about readjustment benefits, we're talking about educational benefits, and we're talking about veterans with disabilities who might need vocational training to get new work, obtain new jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some provisions here, some good, some questionable. Um, one of the issues here is, uh, will VA continue to pay uh, payments for flight training at public schools? And uh, the proposal here is to potentially take that away, if I understand it correctly, Carrie. Uh, as I understand it, uh, not necessarily to take it away, but to limit it. Okay. Um, you know, the, the proposal implies, at least, that that's not a, a limited uh, part of training. Now, I, you know, I, I don't know that I agree with that. I think there are limits to all of VA's education programs. Uh, but if flight training qualifies, uh, and it does, under certain education programs, uh, and it otherwise doesn't break the current caps, then there should be no additional cap on flight training if, if, the, if the VA has otherwise approved that type of training for that veteran uh, given you know, a set of circumstances like their disability or whatever the case may be. So VA should not be in the business of limiting someone's ability to achieve a certain career goal. Mm -hmm. And then there's also a change under Chapter 31. Can you talk a little bit about what Chapter 31 benefits are? As I understand it, those are for veterans who are disabled and trying to get retrained. Is that correct? Correct. Those are for veterans who are receiving basically what's called vocational rehabilitation and employment benefits, uh, voc rehab for short. Uh, they have to be service-connected at a certain rate. Uh, and or found to have a, 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 a service-connected disability that presents an employment handicap. Right. Uh, there's lots of different things that program can do for veterans. Obviously the goal is employment, but that requires training. 
um, school, whatever the case may be for that particular employment goal, uh, VA will usually provide. And then they have, um, you know, essentially employment services once that training is, is somewhat over. Uh, and that may be limited, I think it's a year or 18 months. Don't hold me to that. Okay. Uh, but this provision allows for VA to extend that in two to three month increments up to 24 months. So, so give the veteran who has this kind of disability the ability to really get settled in the new job and prove that they can do it. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. So that we believe that's like a net positive there as right. well, right? And then the last thing which we think is really important is uh, special, specially adapted housing grants. Um, and these are things that we see for people with severe disabilities, these housing grants. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, they're going to expand the group of veterans who might be eligible for that program. And uh, I, we think that's a good thing, obviously, because um, folks with severe disabilities and um, unfortunate dismemberments uh, need that kind of special help, mm -hmm. correct? Correct. And this is one where I wish VA would have been a little bit more specific on this. Uh, the way the, uh, the proposal reads that, that they're going to include certain injuries and dismem dismemberment disabilities that affect ambulation and loss or loss of use of an upper extremity uh, to be eligible. Now, that could mean a lot of things. Right. Um, ambulation obviously means walking, mm -hmm. but the question is, what does that technically mean and how will VA yeah, use norm this? Normally for these benefits, these housing benefits, the, 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 the criteria are very definite. Uh, whether it's loss of use of one extremity together with uh, loss of use of you know two additional extremities of the upper and lower body parts or one extremity together with a certain disease process, you know, it's spelled out. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is good. Uh, I just wish we could tell our listeners more details about it because uh, unfortunately we just don't know. But any expansion of this program is, is good. Uh, do we have any more questions at this point? All right, so let me just sort of summarize by saying, uh, first of all, these are just legislative proposals. None of these have been acted, enacted into law. Um, and it's February 22nd, 2018, just to know where we are if you see this video later on. Um, and some of these proposals are, are really good, um, and some of them we think could be really bad, and it's our job to sort of let you know what we think uh, could be a net positive or something to be concerned about. Um, if you're concerned about any of these things, you can reach out to your U.S. Congressperson or your U.S. Senator and let them know exactly how you feel about them. Um, you can also check up on our website, cck-law.com. Um, if any of you have any specific topics you would like us to talk about in the future, please just reach out to us on Facebook. Um, and it's been a pleasure talking to you this afternoon. I'm Robert Chisholm from Chisholm, Chisholm & Kilpatrick, Jenna Zelmer from CCK, and Kerry Baker as well. Thank you all for being here today and uh, talking about these uh, 2019 uh, budget proposals.